So welcome back everyone. I hope you're all doing well out there. Hope you're all staying safe and healthy. And um, it's really been quite a semester we've had. And uh, we've gone through a lot. We've definitely covered a lot of material. And so what I want to do here is recap the entire course um, and just go chapter by chapter, highlighting some of the important concepts and points that you're going to need to know going into the final exam. And since there's so much to actually cover here, my goal is really not to go into a whole lot of depth uh, on any one of these points. It's really just more of a summary. And that means I'm not doing any example problems here. Okay, I'm just highlighting the concepts. If you wanna get some practice doing example problems, just remember that I posted a review packet to Canvas. And this review packet has a whole lot of problems that cover all of these different concepts. They cover all of the different chapters. So definitely go through all of those in addition to watching these videos, uh, which sort of summarize things conceptually. All right, so with that said, um, let's start with chapter number one. And if you remember, chapter one was all about measurement. Okay, so the basic thing about measurements that I want to discuss first is that any measurement Uh, really has two parts. A measurement consists of a number plus a unit. And you need both of these things for your measurement to even mean anything or to make any sense. So as an example, let's take the density of mercury. Well, if I need a number in a unit, one way I can express the density of mercury is 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So of course, density is a mass divided by a volume. So the units will be some kind of unit of mass divided by some kind of unit of volume, which would be a length unit to the third power. Um, and in general, I don't have to express the density in this exact unit. For instance, I could also express it in kilograms per cubic meter instead of grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so that leads us to the idea of unit conversion. So the way we carry out unit conversion to convert uh, a measurement from one unit to another is we multiply by ratios, which are actually just equal to one and we call these conversion factors. Okay, so just to remind you what it means to say that a conversion factor is a ratio equal to one, just remember that if you take any number and then you divide it by itself, so like three divided by three, for instance, of course that's equal to one, that seems obvious. But in the exact same way, let's say if I took the ratio of one kilometer over a thousand meters? Well, a kilometer and a thousand meters are the same quantity. We're just expressing it in these two different units. So in that exact same way, this is just a ratio equal to one. So when we do unit conversion, we're essentially just multiplying by one repeatedly until we get to the unit we want. And of course, multiplying by one doesn't change a quantity. If you multiply by one, you don't change anything about the quantity we're just uh, re-expressing it in a different unit. That's the idea. All right, so to show you a quick example of this, let's go with that same number from before, 13.6 grams per cubic centimeter. If I wanna convert this to, let's say, uh, so if we wanna go from grams per cubic centimeter to kilograms per cubic meter, then I have to do a couple different conversion factors. The first one, would take us from uh, grams to kilograms. So on the bottom here, I would have 1,000 grams, and on the top, I would have one kilogram. I know this works out because I get the units of grams to cancel. The next thing to do would to be uh, to go from uh, centimeters to meters. So I know that there are 100 centimeters in every one meter, 
but since we're cubing the units, we also have to cube the conversion factor. So I'm gonna take that entire conversion factor to the third power. And when that's all said and done, I have uh, 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter for the density of mercury. So that's how you do a unit conversion. Okay, so that leads us to the next topic which is scientific notation. Now just remember what this is about. This is just giving us a way to represent very large or very small numbers. So for instance, let's say you had the number 100 billion. Um, it would take a long time to write that out because 100 billion in uh, decimal notation is one followed by um, 11 zeros. So that would take a long time to write out. There's a more compact way to write it, which is scientific notation. Okay, so this is uh, used to represent very large or very small numbers. So every number in scientific notation has two parts. First part is a, what we call a coefficient. And the second part is what we call the exponent. Okay? So let's take an example of scientific notation. How about we just use that same number that we were looking at before, 13,600. Now in scientific notation, I can write this as 1.36 times 10 to the fourth power. That number 1.36 is what we call the coefficient. And this number four is our exponent. So it's just some number called the coefficient, which is gonna be somewhere between one and 10. And then multiply that by 10 to some power, that's your exponent. That's how scientific notation works. And just to remind you, how did I know that the exponent was four? There is a simple trick for this, which is to take the decimal point, which um, on this number is uh, to the right of that last zero, and just ask yourself, how many times do you have to move it over before you get the coefficient? So starting here, I have to move it one place, two place, three places, four places, until I get the coefficient 1.36. So since I had to move it over four decimal places, my exponent is four. And this also works for very small numbers where you just move the decimal point the other way and you get a negative exponent. All right, so that's uh, scientific notation. So the last topic here is significant figures. So there are a lot of different rules that we learned about for how you count significant figures and how you round off an answer to the right number of significant figures. But what I wanna do here is just uh, remind you what the whole purpose of significant figures is in the first place. Why do we care about this? So the number of significant figures or sig figs for short in a measurement tells us about the precision of that measurement. So the classic example here is, let's say I'm using a ruler to measure something, and let's say the unit I'm gonna measure it in is centimeters. It would make no sense for me to say that I measured 1.0000000000 centimeters because I couldn't possibly know all of those digits, right? A ruler is only so precise. It can tell you down to the millimeter um, what a length is, but it can't really tell you anything more precise than that. So that's why we have sig figs to round off to the proper number of digits given how precise the measurement was. So as an example, if I just write the number three, okay, that's actually different than writing 3.00. For one, the number three, as expressed uh, in this way, has just one sig fig, whereas the number 3.00 has three sig figs.
And again, the fact that this has more significant figures in it tells you that this is a more precise measurement. And of course, three with just one sig fig is less precise. Okay, so that's, that's the point of sig figs. That's why we have them in the first place. All right, so the last thing we need to talk about when it comes to sig figs is how do we actually do a calculation and then round it to the right number of sig figs? So really, there are just two rules that you have to remember. And the first one applies to um, multiplication or division. So when multiplying or dividing, all you do is round to the lowest number of sig figs. of all of the different numbers in the calculation. Okay, when we're adding or subtracting, there's a different rule, which is that we round to the lowest number of decimal places. Okay, so if, if you can just remember these two rules, you'll be able to uh, round to the right number of digits in any calculation you make. So the next thing is chapter two. And the topic of chapter two is kinematics in one dimension. So the first thing we'll do is break down what that phrase kinematics in one dimension is referring to. So kinematics, is a description of motion. So when we study kinematics, we're not really interested in why things are moving in a certain way. We're just coming up with some sort of mathematics that describes motion. Okay, so the causes of motion are left out in this picture. Um, the one dimension part just means the objects in question are moving in a straight line. So in other words, we're talking about the description, oops, description, there's an R in there, of motion of objects moving in a straight line. Okay, so the first thing that we need to define when it comes to kinematics is position. And position is pretty much just location. Think of it in the same way. This is the location of an object relative to some coordinate system. Okay, so in one dimension, typically, we take our coordinate system to be a straight line called the x-axis. Now, every coordinate system has what we call an origin. In this case, that's just where x is equal to zero. Okay, and this arrow tells us that uh, if we go to the right, that's the positive direction. Of course, if we go to the left, that will be the negative direction. So once we've set up our coordinate system, now we can start talking about position, where something is located in that coordinate system. So let's say this is my object. All I need to give you is a single number, let's say x is equal to two, and now you know the position. All right, next thing is velocity. Now, velocity is basically the rate of change of position. Okay, so if you're staying at the same position and you're not moving away from that position as time goes on, then your velocity is zero. But if you are moving from one position to the next, then you have some kind of velocity. And in particular, um, velocity is really telling us how quickly and in what direction we're moving. 
because of course velocity can come out positive, meaning I'm moving in the positive x direction, or it could come out negative, meaning I'm moving in the negative x direction, okay? And then just the overall absolute value of the velocity tells me how quickly I'm moving. So the way we define this mathematically is that V is equal to delta x divided by delta t. So it's a change in position divided by the time interval. The way we write this is x final minus x initial. That's the delta notation, if you recall, final minus initial. Uh, that's on top. And on the bottom of this fraction, we have t final minus t initial. So the ratio of x final minus x initial to t final minus t initial is velocity. All right, so one really good way to visualize this is by taking a graph of position versus time. So x is on the vertical axis, that's our position, and then t is on the horizontal axis, that's our time. And you should know how to look at graphs like this and interpret what's going on. So this graph can have any shape depending on how the object is moving. But let's just say that our object is moving something like this so that the position time graph is some kind of parabola. Okay, so let's say I wanna know the velocity. And in particular, I'm talking about an average velocity over some time interval. Well, if I draw it out, this is delta x, so that uh, vertical distance we go on the graph is delta x, and this horizontal distance we go is delta t. If I connect those two points, let's try that again. If I connect those two points, there we go, um, then I can really think of delta x over delta t as being the slope of the line that's connecting those two points. So that tells us that velocity is really a slope on a position versus time graph. So the last thing to say about this is, technically what we're talking about here is average velocity. Because I'm not telling you what the velocity is at a specific moment in time. Instead, we're taking an average over that time interval delta t. So in the limit where that time interval delta t goes to zero, so we shrink it until it approaches zero, this becomes what we call the instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous. And in calculus terms, this is dx dt, or the derivative of x with respect to time. All right, so the next thing to define here is acceleration. Oops, acceleration. Which is just the rate of change of velocity. So if you're moving in such a way that your velocity is just constant, it's not changing over time, then you don't have any acceleration. But of course, um, if your velocity is changing in time, then you have some acceleration. And the way it's defined is exactly the same as how velocity was defined. It's a delta divided by another delta. In this case, we have delta v on top and delta t on the bottom. And we can think of this as v final minus v initial divided by t final minus t initial, just like before. And if we make another type of graph, this time a velocity versus time graph, and again, in general, this can be any kind of shape you want, but let's just say our object is moving like this. If we take two points on that graph, let's say here and here, I can talk about delta t between those two points, or the time that elapses between those two points. But I can also talk about delta v by what amount has the velocity changed. And then of course, if I just 
take those two points and connect them with a straight line, delta V over delta T is just the slope of that line. So acceleration can be thought of as the slope of a velocity versus time graph. Okay, that's how we think about acceleration. And as before, if we take the limit where delta t goes to zero, then this average acceleration becomes what we call the instantaneous acceleration. Okay, so in the limit where delta t goes to zero, this becomes instantaneous acceleration, which is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Okay, and so that takes us to the last topic here in chapter two, which is kinematic equations. Now, the first thing to remember about kinematic equations is when are they valid? When can you actually use the kinematic equations? And the simple answer is kinematic equations can be used whenever acceleration is constant. Okay, so if you have an object that's moving along in such a way that the acceleration of that object is not changing in time, it's just staying constant, you can go ahead and use the kinematic equations, but otherwise they're just not valid, so they can't be used. The first kinematic equation that I'm gonna go over is this one, x is equal to x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. So what do these variables mean? Well, as we saw, x is position, v is velocity, a is acceleration, and then of course t is time. But we have x appearing uh, twice in this equation, so let's just differentiate. When we see any variable with the zero or the not subscript, just remember that this refers to um, an initial value. So when t is equal to zero, that's our initial value. So x naught is our initial position. That's where the object is at t is equal to zero. V naught is our initial velocity. That's what its velocity is at t is equal to zero. And then of course, um, if we don't see that subscript, then that refers to a final value. So x on the left side of the equation, this would be a final position. Okay, at time t. So you can plug in a time, and what you get out is the final position at that time. That's how this works. Now, in the same way, we have this equation, which says v is equal to v naught plus at. And again, we interpret these variables in the same way. v on the left side, that's going to be our final velocity. So that would be at time t v naught, that's our initial velocity at time zero. So the variables uh, are kind of denoted in the same exact way as before. Now the last is this, v squared is equal to v naught squared plus two a times x minus x naught. And again, v, that's our final velocity, v naught, that's our initial velocity, a is acceleration, x, that's our final position, x naught is our initial position. So the thing that makes this equation stand out is that there's no time variable. And if you remember where this equation came from in the first place, we basically just took the first two, okay, and we subbed out time to get the last equation. So that's where it came from. The last thing to say about this is that when you see x minus x naught, sometimes we just refer to that as delta x because of course what we're doing is we're taking final minus initial position. And the name for this is 
displacement. Okay, that does it for chapter two. We've covered uh, some of the basic definitions in kinematics, uh, things like position, velocity, acceleration, and displacement. And we went over some of the kinematic equations that can be used when you have constant acceleration. So the next thing to do is to take a look at chapter three, which is all about kinematics in two dimensions. Okay, so we're no longer restricting ourselves to straight line motion when we're talking about kinematics in two dimensions. And so we need to sort of upgrade our math a little bit um, to deal with kinematics in two dimensions, which takes us to the first topic, vectors. So I just want to remind you that a vector is just anything that has a magnitude and direction. So vectors are quantities with a magnitude and direction. And this is opposed to scalar quantities, which have no direction. So what are some examples of each type of quantity? Well, a scalar would be something like the amount of money in your pocket you take out the money in your pocket, you count it up, let's say you have $15, it would make absolutely no sense to say $15 east or $15 west. Those things just don't have a direction associated with them, so we call it a scalar. On the other hand, something like force would be a vector because if I push something, it's one thing to say how hard I'm pushing, that would be the magnitude, but it also matters which direction I'm pushing it in, right? It's different to push something to the left than to push something to the right. So we call that a vector quantity for that reason. Now, on diagrams, sometimes we draw vectors with arrows. So a vector quantity can be represented as an arrow on a diagram. So draw an arrow, something like this. Let's say that's our vector and let's name it A. All right, so in context, we can put a coordinate system on the diagram. So in other words, an X axis going horizontally uh, to represent horizontal motion and a Y axis uh, going vertically to represent vertical motion. And immediately we see that our vector A has a certain angle that it makes with the x-axis. So we're gonna label that angle theta. Okay, next thing to talk about is components. So components of vectors are projections onto each axis. So if we take our vector and we project it onto the, x, uh, onto the x axis, we get the x component. So this is what it looks like in practice. You take the tip of the vector and you draw a line down onto the x axis that's perpendicular to the x axis like this. And this distance along the x axis that my vector makes is ax or the x component. Whereas this distance along the y-axis is our y-component, a y. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward to see. The way we formally write a vector in terms of its components, so vector a is equal to ax times i hat plus ay times j hat. So the i hat and j hat uh, pieces of this are called the unit vectors. And they're called unit vectors because their length is equal to one, but they just point in each of the coordinate directions. So I hat points in the X direction and J hat points in the Y direction. So this is how we fully write out a vector in terms of its components. All right, well, the next thing to think about is how do I know what the components are, AX and AY, uh, given the magnitude and the direction of the vector? Well, 
if we look at the diagram that we just drew, we have a nice right triangle. And remember that cosine is always defined as being the uh, adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Well, what's the adjacent side in this case? That would be AX. The hypotenuse would be the magnitude of A. So therefore, the cosine of theta is equal to AX divided by the magnitude of A. And that gives us the idea that AX is equal to the magnitude of A times cosine of the angle theta. And in the same exact way, AY is equal to the magnitude of A times sine of the angle theta, because of course, um, sine has to do with the opposite side, which is AY. Remember, sine is defined as opposite over hypotenuse, so that would be uh, AY divided by magnitude of A, which gives us the equation AY is equal to the magnitude of A times sine of theta. All right, the next thing we can see is that we can use the Pythagorean theorem. And actually, before I even write this down, let's just remember what the Pythagorean theorem says. It says that the hypotenuse squared is equal to the adjacent side squared plus the opposite side squared in a right triangle. So in this case, the hypotenuse is the magnitude of A the adjacent side is AX, and the opposite side is AY, which gives us the magnitude of a vector is the square root of AX squared plus AY squared, just like that. Okay, last thing is tangent of theta, by definition, is the opposite side divided by uh, the adjacent side which gives us this really important relationship, that tangent theta is equal to AY, that's our opposite side, divided by AX, that's our adjacent side. So let me circle a few things here. These are the formulas that we can use to get AX and AY, to get the components of vectors, if we know the magnitude and the angle. And these equations down here that I'm circling they help you go the other way. So if you know the X and Y components, you can get the magnitude and direction. So it's important to know these relationships. Okay, so the next topic here is vector addition. So the general problem that we wanna understand is if I have two or more vectors and I wanna add them together, how do I go about doing that? So let's say vector R is the sum of a and b. So it's the vector we get when we add two vectors a and b together. For that reason, we call it the resultant, because it's the resultant vector of a and b being added together. The method we uh, employ to find the sum, if we're drawing a diagram, is called the tip-to-tail method. And here's how it works. We connect the two vectors. tip to tail, then we draw the resultant from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector. So that's how it works, um, but it makes a lot more sense when you just see it. So let's say this is vector A. It's pointing into the first quadrant, something like this. And then let's say this is vector B. It's also in the first quadrant, but at a much uh, steeper angle like this. So A and B, as I'm showing you here, are already connected tip to tail, right? Because the tip of vector B is connected to the tail of vector A, just like that. So what does this say? We're gonna take the resultant vector to be from the tail of the first vector. So I'm gonna start right here, the tail of vector A, and I'm gonna end right here at the tip of vector B. So this 
would be our resultant vector r. Okay, now the next thing to look at is what are the x and y components of vector r? And remember what the components actually represent. Let's say I take vector a and I project it onto the x-axis like this. This distance on the x-axis is what we call ax. And if I do the same thing with vector b, project it down onto the x-axis, then this distance would be bx, the x component of that vector. But now also notice that if we project vector r onto the x-axis, that we can also look at the x component of vector r. So just by looking at this diagram, it should be pretty clear that rx is equal to ax plus bx. And we could do the same exact thing on the y-axis, and that would tell us that ry is equal to ay plus by. So in practice, what is happening here is that the x and y components of each vector simply add together. So if I want to know the x component of the resultant vector, just add up all the x components of all the vectors you're adding together. If I want to know the y component of my resultant vector, just do the same thing for the y components. So it's pretty simple. Okay, so that was a little bit about vectors and how we deal with them mathematically. Um, the next thing to talk about is vector kinematic equations. Okay, so if we're dealing with motion in two dimensions, we have to realize that position, velocity, acceleration, these quantities that we defined back in chapter two, they're all vectors. So instead of just using a single number x for position, now I'm gonna have a vector which we call r. Same goes for velocity, that's gonna be a vector which we call v. And acceleration, a vector we call a. And with all that said, we have kinematic equations in vector form that look pretty much exactly like what we had before. So here's one, r is equal to r naught plus v naught times time plus one half a t squared. So it's the same exact kinematic equation that we saw for one dimensional motion back in chapter two, but now all of the variables are vectors. So when we see r here, that represents a final position, for instance. When we see v naught here, this re represents an initial velocity, just to pick out a few variables uh, from the equation, but they're vectors, okay? That's the only thing that's changed. In a similar way, v is equal to v naught plus at. Same exact equation from back in chapter two, now in vector form. So that's the vector kinematic equations. Now the main uh, use for these equations that we've really spent a lot of time talking about is projectile motion. So what is projectile motion? Well, this is when an object moves under the influence of gravity alone. And that means no other forces. For instance, air resistance. So we're just thinking about an object moving through the air in such a way that gravity is the only force that acts on it. Whenever this is the case, we know what the acceleration is. The acceleration is downwards, of course. And the magnitude is something we call g, lowercase g which is 
meters per second squared. In other words, that is the acceleration due to Earth's gravity. If you are on a different planet, uh, lowercase g would have a different value, but on Earth, it's 9.8 meters per second squared. So the general sort of problem of projectile motion looks something like this. First, we draw a coordinate system where y is vertical and x is horizontal. And then we imagine an object being launched in some way. It could be launched out of a cannon, a gun. It could be something that's thrown. It's just launched into the air in some sort of way. And at the moment it's launched into the air, it has a certain velocity. Since that's our initial velocity, we call it v naught. Okay, then as the object moves through the air, we know it's gonna move along this sort of parabolic trajectory like this. And so our kinematic equations basically describe exactly how this projectile moves as time goes on. So let's be a little specific here. For acceleration, there is no acceleration in the x direction, okay? because the acceleration is downwards. It's only vertical. There's no horizontal component to the acceleration. For our y acceleration, we would just put that as minus g because the minus sign indicates downward motion. Remember, the positive y direction is up according to how I just drew the coordinates. And the magnitude is g or 9.8 meters per second squared. So when we go to our kinematic equations, let's say the position equation up here, final position is equal to initial position plus initial velocity times time plus one half AT squared. We're gonna use that, but we're gonna break it down into a separate equation for X and Y. So final X position is equal to initial X position, that's X naught, plus initial x velocity, that's v naught x, times time. And there's no acceleration in the x direction, so there is no third term to write down. It's just zero. For y, we have y is equal to y naught plus v naught y times time in the same exact way as before, but now the acceleration is minus g. So I have minus 1 half g t squared. That's how I deal with position for a projectile. For velocity, here's what we have. We can break it into Vx and Vy. So for Vx, I have V naught X, but there is no acceleration, so I'm actually done writing down the equation. If we go back to what we just said over here, final velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. If there's no acceleration in the X direction, then that second term is just zero. So we just get Vx equals V naught X. Now let's actually write down what that means. It means in the X direction, we have constant velocity. In other words, your final X velocity is just whatever your starting X velocity was. On the other hand, in the Y direction, we definitely don't have constant velocity motion. So Vy is going to be V naught Y, and then I have to do plus acceleration times time. Acceleration is minus G. So I have minus G times T for the second term. So these are the kinematic equations that we use to describe projectile motion. That's where they come from. All right, so the last topic of chapter three is something called relative motion. So the basic takeaway point of this is that velocity is relative. So that means we can't really make an absolute statement about the velocity of an object, right? Let's say I'm standing on the side of the road and I see a car go by. So I might measure that it's moving at 60 miles per hour with my radar gun, for instance. But uh, someone who's driving down that same road might measure a different velocity for that car, okay? So, so the more precise statement we can make is that the velocity of an object depends 
on the frame of reference. That is the frame of reference that it's measured in. Okay, so if we have two different frames of reference, we might measure two different velocities for the same exact object. That's the idea. And there are a lot of different examples of this we could give, but to just sort of have something to picture, let's say that this is the ground, and this is a person standing on the ground. Okay, so that person, whatever they observe or measure, could constitute a frame of reference. And so if we imagine a set of coordinates that's fixed to that person, okay, those coordinates will move however that person is moving, um, we can call that frame A. Okay, so that's, that's one frame of reference we could observe motion with. So maybe another frame of reference would be not someone who's standing on the road, but someone who's moving relative to the road. Let's say someone's standing in the back of this truck here, which is driving down the road at some speed in this direction. Okay, so from the perspective of this observer, okay, we can call this frame B. And again, just imagine that's a set of coordinates that's moving with that person on the truck. Okay, so let's say the person in frame of reference A throws a ball. It can really be anything, let's just say it's our object. And I'll use O to represent the object. So the idea is, of course, these two different people are going to measure two different velocities for that object. And the relative velocity equation tells us exactly how to relate those two velocities. So this is what it says. The velocity of the object, as seen in frame of reference B, is the velocity of the object, as seen in frame of reference A, plus the velocity of frame of reference A as seen in frame of reference B. Okay, so to really spell out what these subscripts mean, that first term I wrote down is the velocity of the object measured in frame B. Okay, this is how it works. And this is how you relate two velocities in two different frames of reference. Okay, so now that we have kinematics in one dimension and kinematics in two dimension under our belts, uh, what we're gonna move on to is chapter four, which deals with Newton's laws, uh, Newton's laws of motion. Okay, so as we move to chapter four, this represents a pretty big shift in our thinking because we were talking about kinematics for this entire time. Now we're moving on to dynamics. Okay, so dynamics deals with the causes of motion. And you remember kinematics is just a description Okay, so we're not just gonna be content to describe how something is moving in terms of position or in terms of velocity or in terms of acceleration, but we want to actually understand why an object moves in the way that it does. So the basic idea behind Newton's laws goes something like this. If we know the forces, if we know the forces acting on an object, we can calculate its acceleration. Okay? And then if we know the acceleration, we can calculate, or let's say we can predict, the position or the velocity 
or both, basically anything about the motion, uh, sometime later. This is using kinematics, using those same equations that we talked about uh, in chapters two and three. All right, so we know that if we know the force is acting on an object, we can predict its acceleration. If we know the acceleration, we can get position and velocity any time later. And that really just predicts how an object moves, right? So, so Newton's laws really predict the future in a, real, in a very real sense, okay? If, if you know what's going on right now, you can use Newton's laws to predict how an object will be moving any time in the future, okay? So there are three laws. And we'll start with Newton's first law. And this is basically what it says. Okay, so Newton's first law. An object will move at constant velocity unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Okay, that's all well and good, but let's draw a few examples so we can understand this a little better. So what would it mean for an object to have balanced forces acting on it? Well, it would just mean that for any force, let's say F1 going like this, there is another force or maybe several different forces that exactly cancel it out. So F1 and F2 in this case would be balanced. And what this is saying is this object that I drew is an object moving at constant velocity. Okay, because overall those forces just cancel each other out, they add to zero, and Newton's first law tells me that this object is going to move at constant velocity. Okay, what would it be, what would it look like to have unbalanced forces? Well, maybe we can draw the same F1 and F2. Those are certainly balanced. But if I introduce a third force, F3, maybe pointing to the right, well, F3 is definitely unbalanced. There's nothing that cancels it out. So this object is not gonna be moving at constant velocity. This object is gonna be accelerating. And in particular, to the right, in the direction of that unbalanced force. So that's really the idea behind Newton's first law. Okay, if there's any kind of net force acting on an object, it will accelerate. But if there's zero net force, if the sum of the forces is equal to zero, then you get constant velocity motion. That's the idea. Okay, well, actually, that's not really the full picture. I'm gonna put a little asterisk on the end of the statement here because there's a little bit more to it than what I said. Everything I just said about the first law is only true in inertial reference frames. Okay, and this means that we're using non-accelerating reference frames, or let's say non-accelerating coordinates, to keep track of motion. Now you don't have to worry about this too much because um, we don't really ever deal with in this class accelerating reference frames or accelerating coordinates. Um, but technically, the first law is only true if we're in a non-accelerating reference frame. We call that inertial. Okay, But pretty much every example you've ever seen in this class is already in an inertial frame, so we can just leave it at that. Okay, so on to the next one, which is Newton's second law of motion. Okay, so... This is the famous statement that F is equal to MA. But to break that down a little bit further, 
when we say F, we really mean the net force. Okay, so I like to write this with a little summation sign next to the F to remind us that this is the net force or the sum of all forces acting on an object. M, of course, is the mass of the object, and A is the acceleration. And this is what I meant earlier when I said that if we know all the forces acting on an object, we can calculate its acceleration because F equals MA is a ready-made equation to do that. If I know all the forces, I can calculate the acceleration. Okay, so now to move on to Newton's third law. Now, Newton's third law has to do with how forces between two objects actually work. When we have two objects, and when those two objects interact in some way, they exert forces on each other. Okay, so they exert forces on each other, and these forces are equal and opposite. So equal in magnitude, that is, and opposite in direction. So when two objects interact, they exert forces on each other, which I should say, which are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. That's really the statement of Newton's third law, but to really understand it, let's look at an example. So I've got a box resting on a table. Okay, very simple situation. Now, what do I know about the forces between the box and the table? I'm not interested in any other force except forces that are between the box and the table. Well, I know the box must be experiencing a force going up like this from the table because something has to support the weight of the box so that it doesn't just fall down. So I know this upward force exists and I'm gonna call it FTB for the time being. I also know by Newton's third law that if the table is pushing up on the box, the box must be pushing down on the table. So I will call that force FBT, force that the box exerts on the table. So let's actually spell that out. So FTB, that's the force that the table exerts on the box. And FBT, is the force that the box exerts on the table. So by Newton's third law, these forces have the same magnitude okay? So the magnitude of FTB is equal to the magnitude of FBT, that is the table pushes up on the box just as hard as the box pushes down on the table. That's what it means to say the magnitudes are the same. If you want to say they're in opposite directions, oops, opposite directions, well, we could write that in terms of vectors as FTB is equal to minus FBT. That's how you indicate that two vectors are pointing in opposite directions with that negative sign. Okay, so that is just a brief outline of the laws of motion. Uh, in the next lecture, we're gonna look at chapter five, which deals with the applications of these laws of motion. But uh, we'll save that for next time. We'll end this one here. So um, I'll see you in the next one. Again, hope everyone out there uh, stays safe and healthy. I'll see you next time.